So today we have a core conversation on racial equity with county departments. So we're very pleased to have three guests with us today. Our guests are Najib Kamil from the Human Services Department, Sven Stafford from the County Administrative Office, and Valerie Thompson from the Probation Department. I'm Nicole Lezen and I'm joined by my co-host, Nicole Young. We are the local consultants who facilitate a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, or CORE. As many of you know, CORE is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan and across our county. And as you can hear, our CORE events are held bilingually in English and Spanish interpretation. And that's thanks to the talents of our team members, Stella Lauerman, who is providing interpretation, Gisela Carrasco, who's translating the chats into Spanish. Great, thanks, Nicole. And as Nicole mentioned earlier, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And it started off as a funding model that the county and city of Santa Cruz adopted back in 2016. So it's been five years now. And uh, County and city are getting ready to issue their next funding uh, request for proposals. So using it again as a funding model. But in those last five years, CORE has also really evolved to become a much broader movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. Next slide. And through a lot of input and insights from many different people and partners across the county, from nonprofits, public agencies, community groups, um, we developed these mission and vision statements that you see here that really are centered around collective action, thriving, resilient communities, shared responsibility, and equity at the center of all of that. And when we talk about equity in core and equitable health and well-being, we really mean uh, that everyone throughout the life, their lifespan across the county has opportunities to experience these eight interconnected core conditions for health and well-being, that everyone uh, needs to experience health and wellness and opportunities for lifelong learning and education and economic security and mobility and thriving families and a sense of connection to community and healthy environments and be, live in a safe and just community and have stable, affordable housing and shelter. And so we think of these things, again, as very much interconnected. It's very hard to talk about how to achieve health and wellness for everybody without also talking about the role of healthy environments or our uh, criminal justice system and policies or, or affordability and accessibility of housing and shelter. So we will often talk about these core conditions um, together and how they, how they operate together, always with equity at the center. And so by that, we mean you know, that we really try to practice and, and make it a habit to examine how not only our individual beliefs and assumptions, but our you know, policies and practices within organizations and, and across systems, how they might be helping and advancing goals around equity or might actually be those barriers and creating uh, those inequities and gaps that we see in some of our in some of our data. So we're really excited to be having this core conversation today about racial equity and work that's happening within the county. And uh, we'll hear today from a few specific county departments. Uh, our goal and our hope is to have these kinds of conversations um, on an ongoing basis so that we are hearing from uh, other organizations and departments as well. But a few things that we've been incorporating into our work in CORE, uh, we've had a, a number of CORE coffee chats, CORE conversations, different trainings um, that have focused on equity and racial equity in particular um, for, gosh, a couple of years now, but I would say even more so within the last year when we started hosting these virtual learning events uh, because of COVID. But some of the things that we found really helpful in our work and that I would encourage you to think about as you hear our, our speakers talking today about, again, work happening within the county, um, to think about some of these terms and definitions and what they mean to you and, and in your organization. So we found it helpful to um, 
understand and kind of clarify the, the distinction between diversity, inclusion, and equity. We use this, this image from Race Matters quite often. So diversity, thinking about you know, different people, different perspectives. Often that's where we talk about demographics so we can get a sense of in terms of representation, um, you know, either in our staffs, in our boards, in our leadership, as well as who we're serving. Uh, when we look at, um, again, kind of the people and perspectives, like do we have, uh, you know, a good cross section there. Diversity is great, and that's a, a goal that we should all be thinking about and working towards. It doesn't necessarily mean that the environment and culture that people uh, walk into or participate in is going to be experiences as, as inclusive, where there is uh, room and opportunity for voices to be heard, for power to be shared. Uh, so that often requires looking at organizational practices and policies and what kind of environment that creates and whether there truly is, again, uh, the opportunity to participate versus just show up and be counted uh, in that diversity bucket. But again, even diversity and inclusion alone don't get you, don't necessarily and automatically get you to equity, the results that come from changes in policy and practices. Um, and you'll hear in a moment that, you know, we think of equity as both a process, the way you do things, and the results that you're aiming for. And, and hopefully we'll hear about both of those from our, from our guest speakers today. Next slide, Nicole. Some other, you know, things that we share as a way to build shared language and shared understanding is then defining, you know, what we mean by racial equity. And, and we use uh, language and examples from the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, or GARE. Uh, has some great training materials. I know the county is working with GARE or departments within the county have started working with GARE. Um, but they define racial equity as closing the gaps so that race can no longer predict one's success while improving outcomes for all. So we really try to mirror that kind of language when we talk about the core conditions for health and well-being and wanting to get to a place where we don't see differences in conditions of well-being that can be clearly tied to things like race, ethnicity, as well as income, gender, things like that. And so what it means is that to close the gaps uh, and close the racial equity gaps in particular, we have to center communities of color, target improvements for those communities that are most impacted by those racial inequities, and that it really pushes us to think beyond just providing more services or different services, but really look at how do we transform our policies, institutions, and structures. Next slide. And some of you might be thinking or wondering, well, why the focus on racial equity? And there are other you know, aspects of equity that are important, and we agree with all of that. Uh, we like to make it clear that we do lead with race. Um, we focus on you know, an anti-racism and a racial equity approach explicitly, but not exclusively. But we do, you know, and, and it's a skill and a habit that we've had to really push ourselves to develop and learn and, and stretch ourselves and be aware of when we might be assuming uh, what people know or what they think and when we need to be really explicit um, so that we're not just adopting and, and perpetuating kind of a race neutral or colorblind approach, but that we're really developing that vocabulary and, and the habits again to have an explicit anti-racism and racial equity approach and that we believe that in doing so that we are actually also addressing some of those other intersecting inequities that when we again and some people call it a, a targeted universalism approach right that when we uh, have a targeted approach focused on race and, and race equity that actually uh, improves outcomes for everyone across all races, genders, bodies, ages, and orientations, because so many of the other forms of oppressions and inequities are so deeply tied to and rooted in racism and the, and the legacy of racism in our country. And again, we think of equity as both a process and the impact that we're aiming to achieve. Um, and again, we need to really think about and, and create those inclusive approaches to, to create those transformational changes. Next slide. So before we start our conversation and introduce our, our speakers, um, we wanted to just quickly review a few group agreements that we'd like to ask everyone on this call to agree to. Uh, we've used these in several of our core conversations that where we've focused specifically on racial equity. 
Um, these are kind of an adaptation of some that uh, a, an equity consultant that we worked with before shared with us, kind of mixed in with some of our own <laughs> that we've used over the years. But we like to encourage everyone to share the air. So being aware of, you know, most of today we'll be listening to a conversation happening among Valerie and Najib and Sven, but there will be opportunities for people to also share and ask their questions and comments in the chat as well as out loud. Um, so just be aware of, you know, how much airtime and space uh, you're taking up. We encourage everyone to lean into discomfort and to take risks. You know, ask those questions that you're not sure you should be asking. Um, you know, if you're noticing reactions to what you're hearing, to notice that, but not immediately discount it or try to move into problem solving and make it go away because sometimes that, very often, that discomfort is where the learning happens. Uh, we encourage everyone to speak from your own experiences, even if it's in the chat. Um, and that's just a you know simple way of saying use I statements and um, just remembering that we can't uh, speak for everyone, even if there, we do have similar backgrounds or demographics that um, we can't necessarily assume that everybody that looks or sounds like us has had the exact same life experiences. We invite you to listen fully and be fully present. We think we're going to hear some really fascinating things and learn a lot and um, be pushed to think about action steps that we all can take as well. So that requires us to listen and be fully present, as well as to be curious and call each other in versus call each other out. If we you know, hear or see something where we're thinking like, eh, I wouldn't say it that way, or you know, <laughs> I wouldn't ask it that way, that we, again, make this a, a shared learning process. Part of that uh, means that it helps to separate intent from impact. So if you hear or see something that you're thinking is, you know, insensitive or even offensive, that to uh, start by asking, you know, questions for, you know, clarification and not necessarily jumping to the assumption or conclusion that someone meant some negative intent or harm. We also ask that everyone honor confidentiality. Uh, we are recording today's session, so just know that if there's something that you want to ask or share about yourself or your organization that we do plan on um, sharing this recording with people who registered but couldn't make the live session today. So just uh, choose what what you know what level of um, detail you want to share. And as always, practice self care. So again, for some of you, you may be hearing or seeing things that really resonate with you that you can relate to, and it might stir up um, strong feelings for you. And so, if you need to step away. Uh, take some deep breaths, take a drink of water, turn off your camera, do what you need to do to, to practice that self-care both during and after this session. Okay, so I'm going to just ask really quickly, does that sound, uh, the, do those sound like agreements everyone can agree to today during our time together? I'll look for either nodding heads or thumbs up. Thank you, Alma. Great, okay. Then uh, I think Nicole, you can go ahead and stop your screen for for screen share for a moment. Um, and I'll again introduce our three guests today. We're so grateful to the three of them for joining us today. We have Najib Kamil from the Human Services Department, Family and Children's Services, and Sven Stafford from the County Administrative Office, and Valerie Thompson from the Probation Department. And each of them have played a leadership role and been deeply involved in racial equity work within their own departments. And so there, I'm gonna start off the conversation asking each of them to, to, to briefly describe what that work looks like in their departments. And then we're gonna turn over to them to kind of have the conversation among themselves. So it's almost like a fishbowl uh, exercise where for most of the time we get to listen and observe, but also we encourage you to think about what, uh, actions or next steps can you see yourself taking or how do you how will you continue your learning based on what you're hearing today so we're going to start with Sven with our first question um, can you tell us a little bit about how the county kind of overall and then specific efforts within the county administrative office like what kind of racial equity work is happening within your department? And I know you've got some things to yeah. show, show us as well. Uh, thanks, Nicole. And thanks for organizing and, and being here. It's a, 
I'm privileged to be here, especially with Valerie and Najib. Um, and so at the county administrative office, um, I'm going to talk about two, two aspects. One is our internal work, which uh, we do through our uh, county operational plan. And then the second thing is uh, that I'll talk about is our uh, circle on anti-racism, economic and social justice, uh, which is um, which is getting going and it's sort of forming and norming stages. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen real quick uh, to show you all our uh, strategic plan website. Um, back in 2018, uh, our, our Board of Supervisors adopted a, a six-year strategic plan, which set forth a vision, mission, and values for the, uh, for the county. And as part of that plan, we have uh, two-year operational plans. Uh, and so we just recently presented, uh, presented our, our second two-year plan to the Board on, uh, um, on last Tuesday. Um, and what the operational plan is, is um, it consists of, you know, let me get it up, it consists of objectives provided by each department and the objectives are, are smart, so they're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. And so for this iteration of the plan back in December of 2020, the board directed us to uh, incorporate an equity lens into our planning effort and you know we had been intending to do that um, for for a while but it had uh, it was nice to get the the official board board support of the uh, to move in that direction um, and so what that uh, what what ended up happening is you know, I worked with uh, with Valerie with Najib and and with other colleagues in uh, in and around the county, uh, we put together a, a training for staff to look at to start creating a common a common language around uh, equity at the county and to give some specific tools around how we can identify disparities or create baselines and then create uh, actual tangible action plans to address those disparities. Um, and so we uh, we had departments take a first shot at writing those. Uh, we, um, we then spent a pretty good deal of time in that committee with Valerie and Najib actually reviewing those and giving feedback uh, to departments on how they could make their objectives stronger. Uh, and then we've uh, we've ended up with 80, uh, 80 objectives within this plan that uh, in some form or fashion try to embed uh, embed equity. Uh, and so on our site, you can go and see them now. Um, you can sort of sort them by external facing objectives that deal with communications and education, community partnerships and county services. Um, and then internal looking uh, objectives that deal with uh, facilities, uh, systems and internal services and workplace. Um, and, and so within the within sort of the smart framework um, and and really trying to be measurable uh, you know we all we often say what gets measured gets done I think in terms of uh, in terms of doing the equity work you know what it's it's interesting to think of the inverse and what doesn't get measured can't be done right if we don't know something if we don't know a disparity is there and we haven't measured it, then there's no impetus for us to um, for us to take action. And so, I just I'll show you one um, one objective that I'm particularly excited about, uh, and that's in our um, our recycling division. And so, it's uh, I mean, if, for those of you that aren't interested in recycling, I would strongly encourage uh, going and doing some reading about it. Um, but this, this is by December 2022, Public Works will disaggregate municipal solid waste diversion rates by route and create targeted interventions to increase diversion countywide, so to reduce trash and increase recycling. 
And what's interesting about this to me is that, um, you know, we have, we know countywide how much we recycle, but we don't know, you know, the, the information by route of how we go, you know, when the garbage truck goes around your neighborhood. And because in this country we're so physically segregated, I think this information will actually provide um, a lot of interesting uh, information about how we can uh, increase increase diversion within specific communities and actually create more culturally competent outreach uh, to to get towards our overall recycling goals. So, uh, so one of the things that's interesting in this plan is taking uh, some of these ideas that are more strongly developed in our health and human services and probation and trying to bring those ideas to the to the rest of the county so our land use policy and our and our general services uh, and so i just i had my five minute timer go off so i'll uh, send it back to nicole thanks sven i love how you made that connection between something that you know recycling that maybe not everyone thinks about other than when they are actually recycling um to then, you know, culturally competent outreach and, you know, different strategies. And uh, so that was, I love how you shared that example. How about uh, Najib, do you want to go next to give us your overview of what racial equity work is happening within family and children's services? Sure. Um, looks like I can't share my screen, Nicole. Go ahead and try again. I just made you a co-host. All right. Awesome. Thank you. So um, great way to start off, Sven, about, you know, um, the work that the CAO is doing. And so before I jump into kind of what, you know, what we started in terms of an approach in um, family and children's services, I just want to, you know, acknowledge that, you know, we're sitting on the ancestral lands of the Awaswas Ohlone and Popoluchum or Amamutsun tribes, and all the original indigenous people of the land um, upon which Santa Cruz County stands. And so, you know, I think that's just critically important when we, you know, start off our conversations, especially about racial equity, that we acknowledge that really every community owes its existence to the work and struggles of the previous generations from all over the world. Right, they're the ones who contributed their hopes, dreams, energy to making <clears throat> the history that led to this moment that you and I are in right now. Some were brought against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes um, in hope of a better life. And some were born here. And some have lived here on this land for more generations that can be counted. So I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge that and pay respects to the elders past and present. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, I want to also frame the work that we're we're going to be talking about, all of us, is that it's an ongoing work, right? Racial equity, it, it's a journey that is long and hard. You know, we can think about like, you know, did the issue of racism and racial equity start in 1619 when about 20 Angolans who were kidnapped by the Portuguese were brought to the British colony of Virginia? Or we can say, oh, maybe it started in 1526 when there was a Spanish expedition to bring uh, to present day South Carolina, some enslaved Africans, right? So you're thinking, okay, four or 500 years to, to really build this kind of race, racist kind of context, it's not gonna take a couple months or a year to dismantle. So I wanna be very clear though, things that we're gonna be talking about is just really, the beginning journey and is in no way saying, yeah, we've got it all figured out. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I preface what I'm going to be talking about. And then in terms of the work that we're doing, it's really about, at least in FCS, I will say it's incremental change, right? So we have, as I mentioned, this long history of which child welfare is a part of, and we have to be very transparent about that. Um, and so we need to start to tackle this issue in little pieces at a time so that it leads to a large impact. 
So in terms of like the overview of the work that we that we started in FCS is really we wanted to focus on racial equity in kind of like four domains, right? You have the people, you have the culture. We're talking about organizational culture in this um, situation. The policies, that's policies and practices. And then the systems, right? FCS or child welfare is part of a system of family serving uh, agencies and community-based organizations. So this is kind of like the domains that we want to kind of focus our work on. And then in those, in, in from that domain, we got kind of a framework in terms of in each of those domains, what we want to do. And I'm not going to go over every single piece, but you can take a look at it. It's about, you know, building shared understanding and vec vocabulary. It's about um, setting racial equity priorities and drive accountability. Um, it's looking at policies and dismantling policies that are perpetuating inequity. Um, and then, you know, data analysis is a critical piece that I'll be talking about. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, this is in Spanish in case, you know, people want it in Spanish as well. And these materials have already been sent to everybody. And then before I, you know, uh, hand it off to um, Valerie, I just want to say in terms of the work that we started is really about action oriented work. We, we need to go beyond, we, we felt like we needed to go beyond the bias training we do maybe once a year, once every two years, and really start to focus on what are the actions that we can do to start to move towards an anti-racism anti organization. Um, and so there, these are kind of three strategies or goals, you can call them, that we were looking at. We kind of started, we did a lot of work on the data um, and looking at past data analysis, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, and started to look at some of the policies and practices. And we have a lot, we have to really start still, I think, the system shift stuff, you know, connecting with partner agencies, uh, working and being open communication and building relationships with the communities that we serve uh, and in the communities where children are being removed. So this is kind of an overview of, of the work that FCS has um, started. Thanks, Najib. And I like how you uh, framed it and kind of, you know, in terms of how FCS is thinking about, you know, people and culture and systems and that awake to work to woke. Uh, framework that, that it looks like you're all using is a really useful. We've, um, and we'll share that article also with everyone afterwards because it's a, you know, it takes a while to, to read through it, digest, but I love that you're using that as a way to kind of structure or think about uh, this action oriented work. Okay, Valerie, you want to give us your overview about what does the racial equity work look like in probation? Absolutely. I think Nicole's going to share her screen and advance slides. So what I sort of want to share with you is in terms of probation, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing internally and externally. So I'm really thankful for everyone here having an interest in what it means to, as I understand folks are saying, sort of really focus on race equity in your work and how you can really move to results. And so I'm going to talk about what it looks like to be actionable um, in your process to actually get to the results that you're looking for in the systems that you serve um, internally and outwardly in partnership with other, other agencies or organizations. So next slide. So in our department in probation, one of the things that we really focus on is we have a heavy reliance on data. And when I say data, we use both quantitative and qualitative data. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the qualitative data in a few minutes. But when we think about the quantitative data, it helps to know where you need to intervene in your systems around race equity if you understand the demographics of the population uh, in the areas that you're serving. So this is just an example of the county population demographics. We wanna know specifically because at probation department, we serve adults and youth. We need to know what is the demographic makeup of of the population of the county, and then how does that compare to the population that we're serving and where we see disparities? So next slide. So where we're moving in our department is our chief, um, Fernando Geraldo, who many of you know, is really leading us through a probation um, race equity initiative that we will be doing over the next, um, through the next year. 
um, and even beyond. And it's where we really are looking at what are our contributions to equity internally? And then how do we look to leverage the relationships that we have with our partner organizations, um, whether they be county or community-based organizations, as well as incorporating the voice of young people and the families and the adults that we serve to know where we're hitting the mark. So this just gives you a sort of a outline, out, I'm sorry, an example of our plan of how we'll be moving this along, which is basically to understand and align the values of our staff and how that contributes to the work that we do and then subsequently the results, right? And then we'll get to new policies and practices that embed equity. And this is just an example of this in Spanish. So next slide. So in our adult division, next slide. This is just, again, a, a sample of the demographics in adult and just lets us know who we're serving along the lines of race and ethnicity and also male or female um, based on gender identification um, offered by those that, that we're serving. Next. And so then we wanna know what our probation type is. And so when we are looking at who we're serving and we're looking at disparities and we're looking at equity, we need to know where are folks coming into our system? What do the charges look like? Which can then tell us what type of needs um, people have so that we know where we're intervening with services and supervision types and trying to support folks to remain in the community safely. And as you can see here, we have a quite a few folks who are on, you know, felony classification of probation versus misdemeanor. Next. Again, this just tells us how we're looking in terms of disparities across our department, but this in adult around the revocations, which means we're tracking revocations and we want to know who's getting the most revocations and how are we going to address that. Next. And then lastly, we're looking at what is the adult recidivism rate? So we want to know who is not successful in the community, what's happening with them, who are they, where are they? So again, we know where we want to intervene in our system when we're looking at trying to create equitable opportunities. And as you can see here, you know, we have a decline in some recidivism for uh, the white population, the Latino population is declining, but we're seeing an increase in the African-American population. So we'll be asking questions and interrogating our system to understand what's going on, where we're seeing the increases. Next. And then in our juvenile division, next slide. Again, we wanna look at the same thing. What's the ethnicity, the gender of the young people who we're serving, and so that we understand how they're showing up in our system. Next. Again, we know we have a majority of young people who are being supervised by us on felony charges versus um, misdemeanor charges. So we want to understand what the needs are um, so that we know who we're working with and how we can work best with them. Next. And again, this represents, this decrease in new placement orders represents what Nicole mentioned earlier, which is our use of targeted universalism. We knew in 2015, we had a very high number of young people going to out-of-home placements. That number was consistently going up and we wanted to know what we needed to do to bring it down. So we used our qualitative data, which was a result of us convening with the young people and families that we served to find out what their needs were, what was missing for them in the system, what was missing for them in the services that were being offered so that we could then step back and develop an intervention or a program that could help reduce those out-of-home placements. And what we got to through targeted universalism was a really good reduction for our Latino or Latinx youth who we were targeting as our program population. But then we also achieved an overall result of reductions in out-of-home placements for all other um, race classifications that we were serving of young people. And that is the targeted universalism approach, which says, focus on your most disadvantaged population and you'll receive an overall, you'll achieve an overall population result, which is where we want it to get to. And so when we think about equity, we want to talk, if you could go back to that last slide really quickly. When we think about equity, we really wanted to think about what it meant to provide services that were accessible to all kids, but specifically to our Latinx population in order to support them in the community. And that's what we were able to do. So the next slide. So we're also doing something similar with in concert with our partners at um, County Office of Education, at um, um, 
PV USD. Um, we have a partnership with CAB, um, working with our community partners to provide services and employment services for young people in school, but meeting their needs through a social emotional approach, which again, through our data and our qualitative data, we learned was a very high need. Next. So as a department, where are we going with our race equity initiative? We're continuing our innovations and system improvements. We're trying to increase capacity with youth and family engagement through our child and family team meetings. We're enhancing our re-entry and transition planning and support so that young people can transition in the community and be successful. It's the same on the, our adult side. How do we provide supports to our probation service center? to be able to support adults in the community and give them equitable access to services in one place. Um, and we wanna to continue to create opportunities to, to support young people, adults, and families during COVID. That just gives you an idea or a sense of how we're using data uh, in probation to really get to equitable outcomes for those that we're serving and in partnership with our partners in the community. Thank you, Valerie. It, um, I really appreciate how you showed how data can be used with an equity lens and uh, gave a really concrete example of targeted universalism. Mm -hmm. Universalism, that was really helpful. Um, can you explain really quickly what revocation is? So a rev is like a violation of your probation. Okay. So you, you're, you revoke your, your, your ability to maybe remain in the community or you have to go back before the judge because of a violation or something that isn't going well. Got it, okay, thank you. Right. Um, you know, and I love how all three of you, you know, talked about not only the value and importance of data, but also examining values, both as individuals and within your departments, how that leads to the policy and systems level changes. Um, I think we're ready to move on to the next question that Sven is actually going to start us off with. So Sven, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so the, the next piece of this is just talking about early progress um, and I'll, uh, I'll help facilitate a little here and hopefully defer mostly to Najib and Valerie. Mostly at the county administrative office, we, we take credit for all of their early progress. Um, and so when you see, when you think about um, some of the things that have happened recently at the county uh, that, that we can look to and point to, I think you know, our public health response in terms of vaccination is is something that we can all be uh, really proud of that public health went out and, um, you know, and made the connections in, in South County and had one of the most uh, sort of equitable vaccine distributions in the state. Um, at the at the sort of facilities level in the county, we've made, we just bought a the West Marine building down in Watsonville that represents sort of the biggest investment in, in South County by uh, the county government uh, probably ever. Uh, and so that's a, that's a big deal. Um, and then one other, one other thing I'll mention is that uh, we we're um, transitioning our public defender to a to a county office, and we recently just went through the uh, recruitment process for the the public defender, and that that process involved um, involved soliciting input from uh, a wide a wide array of uh, community members and folks in the criminal justice system. Um, that uh, that I think was much more diverse than previous recruitments that we've done. And on the interview panels that happened uh, last week, um, we also had a, a you know a diverse group of people uh, interviewing and and rating the candidates and finalists that that came in. And so I think that uh, that process will will result in uh, you know in a public defender will have who will be able to, to stand up and, and be uh, you know, a legitimate representative of not only their indigent clients, but, uh, but of the community also. Um, and I think you know, when we're in, in some of the feedback that, that we've gotten, especially as we've been developing the operational plan, um, it's, uh, it's really been about you know, what has been your process, who's been, who's been able to be involved, who gets to, you know, who gets to come up with ideas for department objectives? Who gets to suggest how uh, how they get formed, how they're refined, um, and how they eventually get into the plan? And so, uh, 
And so that's something that we really need to evaluate. We didn't, you know, we did not do it perfectly by any means this year. Um, but uh, but thinking about those those processes and how we can improve, I think that's that's some of the early progress and thinking that have uh, that have happened, you know, over the past year in our office. Um, but I'd be interested to hear a little bit more from Najib, especially on the child welfare side of uh, the early progress that you all have seen. Great, thank you, uh, Sven. Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, family and children's services, some of the early signs of progress is, you know, we developed and put together the racial equity core team, which consists of um, staff from different levels of the organization and different parts of program. And, um, and that was a critical piece because, you know, this work needs that kind of, um, you know, uh, diversity and experience and and understanding and knowledge and skills and so that was a, a main a major piece that we put together um end of last year um we did a deep data analysis on racial equity in our system uh, so really looking at key uh decision points within and throughout the child welfare system and are we seeing uh disparities are we seeing disproportionality um, and then we also developed a quarterly newsletter that's for staff on racial equity. And it's really, uh, the goal of that is to really give kind of like um, bite-sized snippets of knowledge, of, of, of values, of understanding, of inspiration on issues of racial equity. Um, we also just recently revamped our mandated reporter training. So, you know, one of the things that we've seen in terms of um, disparities is just, uh, you know, the calls that come into our hotline around suspected child abuse and neglect, you know, who's being called on. And so we've added some information and really um, kind of a focus on Let's, you know, are there resources out there in the community that could uh, potentially help a family um, and, and looking and thinking a little bit more deeply before just calling a family uh, or calling about a family to the hotline. Um, and then our leadership team, which consists of program managers, analysts, and the director have gone through uh, a visions training. Um, the county was able to uh, get a, cons a racial equity consultant um, on board and we went through the training and it really focuses on, you know, how do we have con conversations on racial equity and what are some of the things uh, that come up when you have uh, people of color uh, uh, in leadership positions and, and sometimes, you know, it could be only one of us or maybe two of us and, and you know, how do we have those conversations and, and then Part of that training was actually breaking uh, into affinity groups. Um, so we had an affinity group for um, the leadership staff of color and one for white uh, leadership staff. And so, you know, having some really focused conversations about uh, what we experience in the workplace and also what kind of language that we utilize when working with um, a diverse um, staff and how that can impact um, all of us. So that, and th that training is going to be rolled out for our supervisors next, and then our staff um, as well. And then the last thing I'll mention, and, and, you know, we've talked about GARE and, and, and Nicole's mentioned GARE already, but that, but, you know, um, the county has, you know, gotten into a, um, membership, you can get a membership with GARE where all, where you have then this opportunity to get technical assistance um, around how do we become more anti-racist or, you know, um, there's jurisdictions all across the country who are a part of GARE and then we can have um, conversations and, and resources, exchange information between jurisdictions on what they're doing around racial equity. Um, and so the, uh, the hope is to really have access to those tools and guides uh, to move forward the work that we're doing. So, um, and this is not all of the things, I just mentioned a few things. There's some other things that we've done around policies and practices as well. Um, and so we're really excited to see some of the early signs of progress. And of course, we've got a lot more, uh, a lot more to do. Jeeve, I'm wondering if I can follow up with you real quick on just 
you know, between the racial equity core team and the visions training, you know, have you found that conversations around race and equity are confined to those spaces or do you feel like there, or is there an example where you've seen it sort of permeate into the, you know, general, you know, operations of the office? Yeah, it's a def it's a definitely uh, permeated. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we tried to do around the racial equity core team and, and, and just our messaging to, to the division was like, so the racial equity core team is getting together to do some of that work and, and share that information with the division. And it's the responsibility of all of us to be bringing this up in the work that we're doing on a regular basis. So we've seen conversations happening at, the, at different levels outside of the leadership team. And, um, and the racial equity core team. And that's, that's kind of the beauty of the work, right? When you start talking about things, then people start to be more cognizant and aware of it. Um, and so I think that's kind of a really important piece of the work is one, bring it up in all the spaces and places that we interact with and making sure that everybody understands that, you know, it's everybody's role and responsibility. It's not just the the DEI consultant or the racial equity core teams, uh, you know, work to do that. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. I know in our in our office, we were you know about to hire a new hire a new analyst, and for the first time, the sort of executive staff asked the the analyst and administrative staff what they wanted in a colleague. And so I thought that was a, a really interesting um, sort of process point that changed. And then in addition to that, when sort of the analysts and administrative team came up with their sort of priorities for who we wanted to hire, number one on the priority list was representative of the community. And so, and I guarantee that's, a, that's something that wouldn't have come up, you know, a year ago. Um, and so, you know, I think... Um, through, through a lot of these things, we're starting to see, see those changes. Um, and so I'll uh, toss it to Valerie and see, uh, and we've already heard some really great things about probation. I really love the uh, out-of-home placements. I've been using that in presentations for six months now and it never gets old, but uh, I know there's, there's a lot of work that's continuing to go on there. Yeah, it, it is. And I think, um you know, to the degree, I think I just kind of want a norm change for everybody before I get started. And, and even though the question is kind of what are some, some early wins or gains right now in progress, but progress can start right now. Everybody can start from right where you are with whatever it is you see or where your data or indicators tell you there's a need to move change. So just feel free to start right now today and you'll be doing just fine. But I will say that the probation department, we really benefited from early successes starting over 20 years ago when we joined with the Annie E. Casey Foundation to do something called JDAI, which is Juvenile Detention Alternatives, which was meant to reduce the unnecessary use of detention and specifically for young people of color. So having gained like a 67% reduction that's been sustained in the use of detention over years really sort of primed our department to be ready for questions and, and interrogation of our system around race and equity. And so how could we do better? And I think we've benefited from really having a series of great leaders who are willing to sort of embrace this in our work on both our juvenile and our adult side. And so right now, I would say some of our really good signs of progress is really reinvesting in staff by having the race equity initiative, which is being co-led and implemented by staff at all levels, because you really need strong staff engagement. And that was a lesson learned from our JDAI work that started over 20 years ago. And part of that also builds sustainability for race equity work in your systems is by investing in your staff. So I just wanna name that as one of the really stronger pieces of our work that's going on right now. The other piece is that we leverage data across our department. We send out a monthly data blast about how things are going along, disaggregated data metrics across our department, our juvenile hall, our juvenile supervision division, and our adult division, so that everybody can see where are the disparities in our work, where is what's working, working well, how do we build upon that, and it helps to inform how we develop strategies moving forward. I think 
one of the bigger strengths and progress is uh, represented by everybody on this call is that it's much easier now for some reason to work with our community partners and our community-based organizations, our other system partners, whether they be child welfare or public health or the CAO's office or the sheriff's department, it doesn't matter. Just the point is, is that people are now coming to this conversation more easily and the data helps to support the conversation. So I think the progress of aligning contributions, especially for probation saying, we know we don't need to supervise everybody in the community. We know that there are some folks who can be supported in the community. Here's what we're seeing in our data and here's where we need help and support from our community partners and being aligned in that has really been giving us a really big boost to the work that, we, that we're doing um, in concert with our partners. And then one of the other things that I'll mention is the really um, authentic engagement of youth and families um, in the work that we're doing, finding out what their needs are, where their gaps in the community continuum of services, how they're experiencing it versus systems being used to telling people what their experience is and telling people what they need. Well, we're not doing that anymore. We're asking them, what do you need? What's missing? What's working in the community continuum? And then we inform our partners who impact those parts of the system so that they can understand what, what the folks we are serving are telling us um, their experiences. And so then we learn from that and then we build strategies and, and we build programs or change policies or practices based on what we find out is working or isn't working. And so I think for us, we've seen across the board, I mean, some of it is part of a national and state trend, reductions in the number of people that we're, we're supervising. There's trends and reductions in crime and offenses, and there's a shift in focus that some of the behaviors that bring people to the attention of probation are really social, emotional, or those unmet needs that if we could address those in concert with our partners, we actually can see some changes in equity and shifts in our system and how we improve the capacity of our system and system partners to, to serve the community. So I think the real focus, which is aligned with what they're doing at, in HSA and HSD and in the CAO's office and other departments, is aligning our contributions, our work cycle together to actually try to get to some of the same results and maybe even getting to a point where we're all operating under sort of one results umbrella for the community is really what's helping us to get there. And I think the work that Sven is leading um, with the CAO's office is really helping us to really be aligned in our actions and be aligned in trying to achieve these results that we want to see where everybody experiences well-being in the community and probation. We believe we have a contribution to that and to community safety. And the last thing I'll say is that we've proven through our race equity work and through our data that we can make systems change within probation and not compromise public safety because we track that data as well. And that has not been an issue for our department as we move to make systems change centered on race and equity. Oh, I don't know about others, but I could sit here and listen to all this all day. So, <laughs> so many, so many goodies and what all of you have shared. Um, now we're in, so, so many early signs of progress have, you know, we love how you phrase that, Valerie. It's like progress starts now, like, you know, think about, it can be small steps even, right, that you take now. Um, I know you're going to, you're going to lead us in the next question, the next part of the discussion. Um, and then I'm actually going to suggest Najib and Valerie, um, because we're, uh, I think we've got just a little bit more time left for this. Why don't we combine questions two and three about the challenges and what do you doing about those <laughs> to prevent them from becoming barriers. But Valerie, I'll let you kick off that part of the discussion. Sure, I just and I'll be really brief to just allow more time. I think as, as we think about sort of the challenges, think of it as in a dynamic way. And also think about what it means to solve challenges by coming together in a collaborative nature to solve them together so that we aren't working in silos. So we know that, you know, race equity is, is work is needed because almost all of us work in systems that um, are, are built on foundation, at least public systems, on foundation of structural and institutional racism, right, or racialized practices. So we already know that. 
Um, I can say the reason I do this, they, you might ask the question, well, why do you work for probation then? It's because I believe systems can change because people build systems and therefore people can change, right? But we have to do that in alignment with our community partners and our system partners in order to move change. So as we think about, you know, challenges and what it takes to um, either address barriers or slow them down, um, I want to hear from Sven and then Najib about how you see those challenges and your efforts to address those barriers in the CAO's office and then for, for Najib um, in FCS. Um, yeah, thanks, Valerie. I think, uh, you know, I'll talk about just a, you know, a personal challenge and then sort of an organizational or structural challenge. Um, you know, personally, I think there's always, for me anyway, as a white man, a little bit of an imposter syndrome uh, coming in and talking about equity in these spaces. Um, and then also the realization that it can't, uh, you know, we can't leave it all up to um, people of color to be solely responsible for carrying that conversation forward. And so uh, trying to figure out how, how, you know, I can fit in that space and, and try to uh, lead from the position I'm in. Um, I think you know one of the one nice framework I've I've uh, read about is just this idea of a uh, um, from a philosopher named Burke of an unending conversation. Right, that there's been as Najib pointed out this you know hundred year history going forward where people have been having this conversation, and then at some point you jump into this work in your organization or for me at the county uh, and you sit around and you listen for a while and then eventually you pick up on what's going on you find something to say people react to you and then you know and then you're part of the conversation and it's your you know it's your responsibility to push it forward and and try to and try to achieve something that that you can and then when when you leave the conversation keeps going on without you uh, and so it's just uh you know, I think all of us in that in that space can can ask ourselves what can we be doing to you know to contribute to the conversation, um, and then organizationally, I think the um, you know the county is a um, is a large institution. It's it's got a certain inertia to it, and it's. Um, you know, it's not. Uh, it can it can move fast if it wants to, but it's not designed to move fast. And so, um, so the biggest challenge for us, I think, is how to resist sort of going back to normal. Um, and uh, you know, I think we've got some. Uh, we've got our little. I like the way um, Najib also phrased the small actions. I actually, I do believe that those small actions are the ones that really matter, right? And so we've taken you know, these, we have these 80 objectives, it's like 80 small actions. And now all we've got to do is do the work, right? And so, you know, figuring out what, what support departments need um, to do some, some of the internal work, but also, you know, what resources they might need to change those, those systems uh, within which they're working. Uh, those are, as, as Valerie and Najib have said, all really difficult but important conversations to have. And so, um, you know, from from our office's point of view, how do we how do we support that and make sure that those that those resources are available? Um, and I think you know, with probation's work with JDAI, with HSA and HSD um, uh, joining GARE, uh, there are also a couple really important land use opportunities with. Uh, uh, looking at our, our general plan and then looking at a climate action strategy and trying to bring sort of an environmental justice lens to that work. Uh, there are a lot of really, really important, um, you know, processes that are going to start taking place over the next, over the next two years. And so I think, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be up to us here to make sure that those are, are inclusive and, and that those processes really, um, really work for as many people as possible and not just uh, uh, as they have often in the past, uh, people in position of power. Great, thank you. Najib, can you share how things are going and you're addressing challenges in FCS? Sure, yeah. So, you know, I'll just quickly mention two challenges. There's, of course, many, but I would say two, two challenges. One is, really building a sh building that shared 
foundational definitions and understanding of anti-racism. You know, I know, Valerie, you mentioned this in terms of the work that you've do, been doing in, in probation, but one of the things that we see is that when people don't have that shared foundational language, they don't have the conversations. They're afraid to bring things up. People are afraid to either offend somebody or people are afraid to like, oh, I might come off as such and such, right? Uh, confrontational, adversarial, whatever the the adjective is. And so, you know, one of the things that we are trying to do through some of the work that we're, we're doing with visions training, as well as the uh, quarterly newsletter is to address that and build the capacity for the organization to have the conversations um, and have an understanding of what we mean when we say equity or anti-racism or, or, or uh, equality versus equity, right? So all of that is critically important. The second challenge is just time, right? Child welfare is a very crisis-oriented um, work, right? And so how do we make sure we don't keep getting caught into the next crisis and the next crisis and put the time and effort to really work on this? Because it's critically important work. Right. And but how do we find the time? So that requires some really, um, you know, focused like this time. We need to spend this time. We need to spend the money like get, becoming a member of GARE, getting the consultant. Right. So we have to put, you know, money where our mouth is, as, as, as they say. Right. So I think these are some two major uh, obstacles that we do encounter. And then. How do we kind of counteract those barriers? And, and you know, I love this uh, quote by James Baldwin, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced, right? So we tend to not move because we're kind of paralyzed because we don't know what to say or do, or we can't find the time. But if we're not, if we, if we say we want to address racial equity and then we're not really doing anything about it, it's not going to go away. Um, so, you know, some of the things that we're trying to do to overcome the barriers of, of, of the shared understanding and the time is to really continue to bring up the racial equity issue in all the places and spaces that we're, we're in, in all the conversations that we're having, right? Because then people will get more comfortable talking about it and start to know what the definitions are. The others bring the data. We've talked, you know, Valerie's talked a lot about that. Sven's been talking about that with the um, strategic plan. Bring the data and always have that data uh, updated, have like a dashboard, if that makes sense. Um, and then start digging deeper into the data. You know, the disaggregation is really important uh, when we disaggregate by race and ethnicity. Connecting the values of social work you know, to racial equity, the why of the work. I think sometimes when we're so caught up in the work and the day-to-day -day stuff, we can kind of lose sight of the why. And it's important to bring up that why in the meetings that we're having. And the last thing is just barriers and challenges are there to be overcome. You know, sometimes we look at them as things that stop the work. And I think that that's not the right, you know, frame to have. The right frame is to like look at a barrier and say, okay, let me try to figure out how do I overcome it? What's the problem? Let me solve it, then move on to the next problem. Um, and that's how we make those incremental changes. Um, and then the last thing I'll just, you know, uh, another quote by Adrian Marie Brown, um, who's, you know, a great, you know, she's a, an amazing author, talks about various things like organizing. Um, and she has a quote that says, science fiction is simply a way to practice the future together. I suspect that is what many of you are up to, practicing futures together, practicing justice together, living into new stories. It is our right and responsibility to create a new world. So we need to start moving now. Like right after this presentation, I'm hoping that you guys have uh, some ideas and, and, and start doing the work. You know, um, I think the time for thinking about what we want to do in conversations is, is done. Oh, thanks for leaving us with that really, uh, I think, meaningful and relevant quote, Najib. And there's a couple questions that we got uh, when people filled out their registration forms. I know we have some in the chat. We'll try to do, you know, have you address as many of them as we can today, but there might be some that we'll have to hold for later or maybe ask if you can 
I'll share your thoughts um, afterwards so we can share that as part of the follow-up email. Uh, but one of the questions that was asked as part of the registration was, um, what advice can you give an employee of color who looks around the workplace and sees little to no similar representation either on the front lines or in management? I'll take that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I can say this is my experience every day as an African-American woman who sits at the county level where I do. I go into meetings and do not often on most days, if at all, see anybody who looks like me. And so what I do to sustain myself is first lean into the allies in the work who are all races and ethnicities because we are all in this work together. So it's not about alienating anybody, but it's leaning into that allyship and really getting support in that way. And then on my own, where I need to have some conversations that wouldn't be the same experience for people who don't look like me is to lean into that network of leaders that I work with across the country and have those conversations and opportunities to support each other to continue to do the work. But I think the most important thing is to really lean into who you are working with and, and who are allies in the work and who you can share thought partnership with. And it's not such an isolating feeling when you know you're working amongst fellow champions. Thanks for that, Valerie. Najib, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add two quick things. I think the other thing is it's important, you know, to just continue to bring up the racial equity uh, issues in meetings. I know it can sometimes, especially if you're the only person, it can feel like, oh, you know, here I go again, or I'm sounding like a, uh, you know, broken tape recorder. And it's okay to sound like that. It's okay to repeat that all the time because, you know, I feel I find that, you know, um, if if we start to feel like, you know, I just keep mentioning it, so I'm going to stop, then people are going to stop hearing about it. Um, they're going to forget about it, um, especially if you're the only person of color um, in your team. So I think that's an important piece to continue to to bring it up. And then um, the second piece is, you know utilizing your your uh, supervision support, right? So if you, you're reporting to whoever, having those conversations with them, right? Um, about, could be about hiring, could be about, um, you know, uh, promotion, you know, bringing these things up about who's getting promoted, who's not, um, and who's getting hired and where are we recruiting, right? Uh, so I think there's ways to start to um, kind of have these targeted conversations with, uh, with your your your, your supervisor, um, and and also uh, making sure that you don't stop bringing those issues up. Thanks for that, Najib. And Sven, I'm going to ask you kind of a, a different twist on that question. As someone who identifies or has identified himself as white in the, in this meeting, um, like what do you have any advice? Like as someone who might notice those kinds of dynamics, or like what have you seen or heard in terms of like um, when there is that kind of imbalance or, uh, you know, when there's a group where it's, you know, more heavily weighted towards, you know, white versus people of color, like, what are some things that uh, other managers, other supervisors, other coworkers could do to help balance out those dynamics and, and help create that inclusive environment so it doesn't feel like that responsibility of speaking up always falls on the person of color? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's certainly one of my, one of my blind spots. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a whole lot of white. It's a, it's um, yeah, it's a good, it's a great question. And I think if, I, I think Najib's right, if you're not, uh, um, if you're not, you know, I don't think it, you know, have to constantly bring it up in meetings. If you find someone, you know, uh, and and take them aside and and say you know would you mind bringing this up in in the staff meeting or uh, you know to try to find um, you know some people to support you like that uh, I think you know one of the one of the things that we've done in our office anyway is um, sort of rotate facilitation of meetings so it's not just you know one one type of you know a pos one position or one person who's always who's always facilitating the meeting and then 
you know, you can um, put your own spin on things or include things in the agenda that uh, that are important to you. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it is on, um, you know, it's, it's the responsibility of a lot of us to, to make sure that we're being inclusive, that if folks aren't, um, I've told this story before that, um, that I've never, as part of, as part of just an example, I guess, of my privilege, right, is that I often sit in rooms and don't say anything. And then people come up to me afterwards and say, like, you're just, you're such a great listener. Or what did you really think about this? And I'm sure that doesn't happen, I mean, to, to other folks, right? And so that's, uh, you know, I think it's just important for, you know, for me to keep listening to, to, you know, those stories of not being included and, you know, making sure that when we're in those situations that we're asking, you know, going around to everyone who's, who's being quiet or hasn't had an opportunity to contribute, um, that their, that their voice is heard, uh, and, um, and thinking about those processes. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that, Sven. I, I saw a private chat that said something similar about, you know, inviting others to speak and share their point of view that, you know, it's such a simple technique, but, but often it can be easy to forget to do that. And so that also takes practice um, so that it, it does happen naturally, happens often. Um, and there's a question here about, uh, for you, Sven, about the, the, can you talk a little bit about the advisory committee that's made up of activists and leaders of color that's led yeah. by the county administrative office, right? Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Uh, I know I said at the beginning that I would, I would touch on it. Uh, I got too excited about recycling. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. So we have a, a circle on anti-racism, economic and social justice. Uh, as I said, we're sort of in the forming and norming stage of that, of that work. Um, the, the community, community leaders and, and folks that are on that, uh, and participating in that committee are, I think, um, you know, trying to trying to push push change, and they're in the best way impatient with with the county. And I think, as I said before, the county can change quickly, but it's not built to, or designed to change quickly. And so I think we're, you know, we're in the process of sort of listening to that group and learning and trying to figure out what we need to unlearn. Um, about uh, about the way the county operates, and um, I think that's been it's been a good conversation, and we've uh, you know we're we're coming along with that. Um, you know, they've indicated that they really want to work on on looking at racism as a public health crisis, and so we're trying to you know figure out uh, the best way for them to have that uh, um, you know overarching look at social determinants of health in the county and how we're able to address those um, not you know not just as the county but the county in partnership with our our communities with our schools with our uh, nonprofits um, and and all the you know there all the abundance or resources that we do have here in Santa Cruz County um, and then you know, they've also indicated that uh, that we really want to try to create a, a brave and safe safe space to talk about racial equity in the context of the county and all the the various places that that we can touch on that. And um, I think you know, working on working together, uh, we're we're getting there and having having that conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's been an interesting, certainly an interesting process. And, uh, anyway, I've, I've been able to learn a lot and, and grow from having those conversations and being in those, in those meetings with, uh, with folks like Marie Elena. So thanks for the question. And I think we have, we might have time for one more question, <clears throat> excuse me, that was asked in the chat. And then we'll and then we'll move on to talk about our next steps and what's coming up next week. Um, so there's a question in here. Now I'm trying to find it um, from someone at Central California Alliance for Health. They're working on increasing COVID vaccination and equitable access for the Black, Indigenous, people of color population or BIPOC population. 
So the question is, what are you seeing or hearing as barriers, or do you have any feedback for, for or are you hearing any feedback from those who may be vaccine hesitant? Is that something any of you have insights about or things that you're hearing about from the families the, and communities that you work with? I can only speak to one thing just sort of specifically that I've, you know, heard recently, which is, you know, when you're in communities where, and we're talking specifically sort of about the Black population, when it is so small, they actually don't see a reflection of themselves in the people providing the services. And so, therefore, there are issues of trust um, that then come up for them because they're not seeing a reflection of themselves. So I think to the conversation about hiring and diversity and being really intentional about that is to not forget about even your smaller populations for whom disparities can really explode because their numbers are so small and paying attention to what it looks like to, to be of service um, to, to folks in those communities. But one of the things that I'm hearing specifically just to sum up is just when they don't see folks who are providers or messengers that look like them and can help them really understand and then build trust and then get to the point where they will become vaccinated, that becomes a challenge. And I can see that being a challenge in communities where those populations are so small that the workforce across public and private agencies and organizations don't actually reflect them. Thank you, Valerie. Any, anything you wanna add, Najib or Sven? Or others that are still, I know everyone else has pretty much been in listening mode, but you can tell from the chats that people are appreciating the conversation, the candidness, um, but if anyone else has thoughts too about the vaccine hesitancy and how to, um, you know, really reach and build that relationship and the, and the trust with different communities, feel free to share it um, in the chat or out loud. I think, um, this is a good time to uh, talk about next steps. And, and actually, I mean, we'd like to ask everyone to think about like all that you heard today. And again, the uh, just, I think, openness from Valerie and Najib and Sven about, you know, the, not only the efforts, those early signs or small successes, small wins, and also the very real challenges, right? That, and, um, and the constant ongoing work it takes, right, to, to address those challenges, not have that be the barrier that stops progress. Um, and we just invite everyone to, to share in something in the chat about what is your takeaway? Like, what is the, what is the thing you are going to leave and, and do differently <laughs> as a result of today's conversation? And it could be that you're going to, you know, go and learn something else. You're going to look into you know, a resource that you heard mentioned, you're gonna reach out to someone about, you know, either maybe mentoring or, you know, creating that kind of uh, allyship in the work environment. Like what is, what is an action step that each of you are willing to take as a result of this conversation? I see some great comments in here about just how inspiring your presentations and your discussions were. How are you gonna turn that feeling of inspiration into action? Give you a moment to think about that, to put it in the chat. And then I encourage you to register for next week's core conversation. We'll do a very similar process, similar kind of format, uh, this time with leaders from local nonprofits. So we'll have, um, people from Encompass Community Services, Santa Cruz Community Health Centers, Coastal Watershed Council, and Community Action Board, who will have a similar, um, you know, give an overview of the racial equity work they're, they're doing within their or own organizations, and then have a conversation with each other about early signs of progress, challenges, how, how you keep those challenges from becoming real barriers. So, We'll put the registration information in the chat in a moment and also send out the registration announcement later today. See some things coming through in the chat about, I will try to keep speaking up, recognize and encouraging participation by all. Progress starts now, I will do my part to start today. Yeah, lots of, lots of again, great nuggets to remember and, and take, take away with us. 
explore more about the concept of targeted universalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was kind of a good reminder to me, even though I said it earlier. I was like, oh yeah, I need, <laughs> I need to revisit that and how, you know, how we can apply that concept in core more explicitly. And, and uh, so help to see and hear that, that example that Valerie shared and just, again, kind of bring that back up to the surface as a really valuable equity strategy. Okay, our last ask of all of you today, feel free to keep adding to the chat your what your action steps are. And then we would always love to get people's feedback about these core conversations, core coffee chats. The, the poll that I just launched is calling it a coffee chat, but just um, these longer conversations on racial equity, we actually call them core conversations. So if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to fill out the feedback survey before you go, we would appreciate it. We do look at everybody's feedback. When you leave this meeting, you should see on, on your, uh, on a web browser, I think it'll open up another short survey where actually you can answer some open-ended questions and provide more uh, detailed feedback and, and responses if you would like. But we appreciate everyone joining us again today. Uh, this was a really rich conversation. Set a great example. <laughs> We told Valerie and Najib and Sven this morning, we're like, this is a little experiment, this kind of format where they really get to, you know, take hold of the conversation and, and you know, lead it among themselves. So uh, this, I, I thought you all did a fantastic job and just really appreciated, again, the information you came with and also the conversation and sharing that you uh, did among each other. And so we'll look forward to having a similar conversation ne next week with our nonprofit partners. And we'll, Nicole and I will continue to schedule and host these kinds of core conversations with you know, a variety of different partners and organizations that again, we're continually building our collective knowledge right, about how, how we move this kind of racial equity work forward in all different types of settings and organizations. So thank you all so much.